I mean, what's pro football focus doing? Last week they had Brady. This week they got Brady. We're doing it. We're literally doing it differently from everybody else. Hey, as a matter of fact, moving forward from this point on, I will not make reference to PML. Do you not understand that they are that way because you're Joe Flacco? And you just like to discredit things that people deserve credit for. That you can't possibly be expected to defend that. Talk about the game, Sam. So, Who cares about what people think about us? Yeah, I like football, I like football season, all the things that go with it. Welcome in to the PFF NFL Podcast. Steve Palazzolo here with... No, no, it happened again. Nah, Sam Monson. That felt forced. No. That felt forced. We had a, um, we had a false start where my voice completely cracked, but it's lost. The audio yeah. is lost and gone forever. But, it's a uh, shame because it was beautiful. You went full Kirk Cousins. I did. I did. And uh, I wanted to cut it <laughs> out. You said roll with it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, something happened. I don't know. Anyway... <laughs> Welcome in. It's the PFF NFL podcast, and it is mock draft time. Now, if you're watching us, you're seeing Sam from some sort of nice stadium, and you're seeing me from a less nice AAA stadium, the Fresno Grizzlies, uh, my home, 2008 and 2009. Where, where are you, Sam? The, uh, the spiritual home of Irish rugby, Steve, the Aviva Stadium, where Ireland plays and occasionally Leinster as well, depending on how big the game is. That's assuming there is rugby on, but when it is, happens right back there. That's both of your teams right there, huh? Yeah. Prov- awesome. Province and uh, country. Yeah. Well, that's great. Uh, hope they get back soon. Uh, <laughs> anyway, we're, uh, we're mock drafting here today. And here's what we're going to do. The people spoke and they wanted us to do it live-ish. So we're going to do it live-ish. Sam has uh, – we've done some prep, as Sam likes to say. We, we've gone through this, but um, we're going to switch off every pick. I'll take the odd – picks he'll take the even picks we can even talk trade and uh and we'll go from there and then we decided as well this will be kind of like a hybrid you know do you the the question's always would you do a mock based off what you would do would you do it based off what you're trying to predict what the teams would do we decided along the way there'll be some picks that we feel good about that we want to make and then other picks where it's more um here's what we think the team might do you know so it's a little cop out how's that yeah, I think there were some occasions where the story of what Team X would do is just too good to ignore. So, frankly, for the sake of entertainment purposes, we're going to roll with that somewhere along the lines. All right, perfect. So let's, uh, let's get into it. There have been trade talks happening. Yes. Some big trade talks happening. But they're not happening yet. So with the first overall pick in the NFL draft, the Cincinnati Bengals select almost hometown hero Joe Burrow from LSU. He's from the same state, mm. and Burrow is going to be the guy. Listen, I, I fielded offers, but they weren't, they weren't good enough. People inquired, what would it take to get to number one? Uh, I wanted like four or five, six, seven first-round picks in exchange, so that never happened. And uh, Burrow's the guy. He's the guy for the Bengals to lead them to the playoffs. He's got great accuracy. He's got some playmakers to work with now if A.J. Green's healthy. And uh, the Bengals are going to be playoff contenders sooner rather than later because of uh, Joe Burrow. He's the pick at one. All right. I think that makes sense. Yeah, the, the only thing I was interested about with that pick was how many calls you were fielding and how close anybody got to that offer. And you're saying not very, not close enough. Not close. Multiple calls, not close to the offer, though. So um, Burrow's the guy for my Cincinnati Bengals. <clears throat> now, you're up at number two with the Washington Redskins. Where are you going with this? With the Redskins. So here's what we're doing. We're getting, this is where the trade talks start because I think the trade that we talked about on the last podcast is just too good to not make happen for real. So the first thing that's happening is the Miami Dolphins are chasing Tua. They're chasing Tua. They're going up to number two to make it happen. I know Adam Schefter is reporting that, you know, they might not be as in love with Tua as everybody else thinks they are, but this is where the what we would do takes over. And it's like, look, two is really damn good when he's on the field. And the prospect of a top quarterback is too good to turn down. So they're going up to two and chasing after Tua Tagovailoa. So that part is happening, right? Three spots. And in order to make it happen, the trade value chart, which we know is outdated and not really accurate, that says all it takes to happen is number 18. We're going to give him number 18. 
we're going to give him number 39, their second round pick. And I suspect we're probably also going to have to throw in something next year. But, you know, let's just shelve that for the moment for the sake Keep of keeping simple. the whole thing straight in our brains. So they're going to get number 18, their higher of the first round picks, and number 39, their second round pick, for Miami to jump up three spots and the Redskins to come down. Um, and obviously they're taking two up. But that's only part of this trade. We're going to make it a three-way trade with the next part that, that leads us to uh, number three. All right, so the Lions at number three, we're making it a three-way deal, as you said. This never happens in the NFL, so we figured, hey, why not? The Lions are now going to move from three to five, meaning the Redskins have moved back up, or they've just moved down one spot overall. And the Lions are going to get that number 39, that second-round pick from the Dolphins. So let me recap really quick. The Dolphins, they get number two from Washington in this deal. The Redskins essentially get number three, from the Lions. They move from two to three while also picking up number 18 from Miami. So I think for Washington, just to move down one pick and still probably take the same player, wow, amazing deal for them. But then the Lions, they kind of roll the dice a little bit. They go from three to five. So they essentially give up Chase Young or Jeffrey Okuda, whoever they want at three. They're risking the guy that they want, but also adding number 39 in the second round from Miami in this deal. And so the Lions have an opportunity to move down two spots and pick up another potential starter. So I think it's a win for them. This is truly a win, win, win. The Dolphins giving up the most draft capital, obviously, but if it's for a quarterback, it's well worth it. Plus they still have another first round pick. So that's why they got into this position in the first place. Yeah. I honestly think it's, it's a rare win, win, win trade because the Dolphins get the quarterback and that makes them win whatever, right? They gave up a lot to make it happen, but in theory, the quarterback trumps everything. The Redskins pick up an extra high pick to just move down essentially one spot by the end of it all. That's amazing. And the Lions, right, and the Lions pick up extra capital, basically gambling that the Giants won't take Jeffrey Okuda, right? They know Washington won't because Washington wants to come back up to take Chase Young. So at that point, all they're doing is, is weighing the opportunity of Okuda, who is the guy they want, making it past the New York Giants one pick above them and weighing whether that's worth picking up a second round pick to make happen. And I would say it is in terms of gamble, given that the Giants have young um, cornerbacks, they just invested in James Bradbury. I think there's a reasonable chance that they would pass. So for the Lions, I think it's a win. You get that extra pick for going down and getting the guy you wanted anyway. So I think it is a very rare win, win, win trade. And that sets up what pick number three, you guys, the Redskins taking Chase Young. Yes, that's what we're going to do. The Redskins are going to take Chase Young. So from the Redskins' perspective, moved down one spot, picked up number 18, still got Chase Young, add him to the mix. Uh, did we debate picking Tua? Yeah, sure we did. Sure we did as Washington. But uh, we've decided uh, the value of having that number two pick is not the player that you take. It's how many multiple players, multiple shots you could take in the draft. And the fact that we added the 18th overall pick to, I think, is a huge win for my Washington Redskins here at number three. So going with Chase Young, the best pass rusher that we've graded in a given season ever at PFF College. And uh, yeah, he projects well at the next level. Yeah, I think that's a steal. So where are we next? We're going to the Giants. This is their so spot, far, right? We have Burrow, Tua, and Chase Young off the board. We'll do a little reset every now and again. Nice. Giants are up at number four, and, you, and you're the guy here, Sam. So the Giants at four, this, I think, if it was us alone picking, I think there's a very real chance we would take Jeffrey Akuda. But I think the Giants, they're just not going to go that route. I think because of what they invested already in cornerback, they are going for the offensive line. They're going to protect Daniel Jones. They're going to give him a shot. I think they like some of the weapons they already have for him. So they're going to build up the pass protection, and they are going to take offensive line help and I think the sort of hybrid of what they would do and what we would do, we're not going to give them Mekhi Becton because in our <laughs> world, that would be crazy. So instead, we're going to give them Andrew Thomas, who is our best projected tackle on the board. And at least if they're going to do the wrong thing, they can do the wrong thing with the right player. I like it. Yeah, Thomas uh, started at right tackle during his career. He would step in at right tackle. He still have Nate Solder at left tackle. You know, the tackles, uh, was it Solder and Remmers last year? most or second most pressures allowed among any tackle tandem in the NFL last year. So 
Um, I, I think in real life you are going to see them look heavily at that position. So I think that makes sense, Sam. Andrew Thomas to the Giants at four. So that puts me back up on the clock at number five uh, for the Lions again. And this is why we're saying it's a win-win-win. There is this scenario where the Dolphins just make sure that they get their quarterback. The Redskins essentially walk away with the player that everybody thinks they want anyway with Chase Young. And the Lions walk away now with Jeffrey Okuda. That's who we're taking at number five, the player that we think is the best fit for them anyway. And, you know, the Redskins and Lions pick up extra picks uh, for that security that the Dolphins paid for. That's essentially what they paid for. Um, so Akuda, man coverage. He's the top corner on the board. They play a ton of man over in Detroit. They have Desmond Trufant over there and can't just be Desmond Trufant as the number one corner. So you got Akuda back there as well. And the Lions picked up number 39 overall in order to move back to five and still get their guy. So love this move for Detroit at five right. overall. I've seen Evan Silva did a mock and he's going to be on the, the PFF forecast today. And he had the Lions trading down and then Akuda still being on the board just like us. And instead he passed on him and gave him Derek Brown, which strikes me as maybe the meanest thing you could do to the Detroit Lions fans. We did essentially the same thing, except we gave them Akuda. And, you know, we've, we said before about, you know, what, what would they do the debate if, if they had the choice between Chase Young and Jeffrey Akuda? The bottom line is coverage will make a bigger impact to that defense and propel them in the right direction more than elite pass rush will. And I know, you know, people will point to the addition of um, Nick Bosa a year ago for the 49ers, but you need to understand that they didn't just take the 2018 defense and add Nick Bosa to it. There were more changing parts or more things at play that made an impact. Richard Sherman played dramatically better in isolation. Even if you remove the pressure of Nick Bosa on plays with no pressure, Richard Sherman was dramatically better than a season ago. So coverage will make a bigger impact. And you can say that, well, they don't value coverage more than pass rush because they traded away Darius Slay. But maybe they just don't value Darius Slay more than pass rush. So I think Jeffrey Kuda is the smart move. It's the right pick for them. And I think he would make the biggest impact if he becomes a, a decent player. Yeah, let me just take a minute, though, to say it's not you – know, we're, we're touting this coverage over pass rush thing. But there's, there's a lot of nuance to it. I mean, yeah. in last year's draft, Nick Bosa was more valuable than every other corner that was drafted last year. So after one year, the Niners, you know, getting Bosa, they, they got more value out of him than they would have um, most other defensive players, I would say. Um, and then, again, the thing that we keep weighing is the ability to predict how well the interior pass rusher or the edge, edge rusher is going to perform versus the coverage player. There is a good chance uh, that we that Chase Young or Derek Brown actually will be better players in isolation than Jeffrey Akuda. The thing about Akuda is he could be, say, like a second tier corner and still probably bring more value than an elite edge. That's kind of like where the balance is. I, I've been trying to study this a little bit using our war numbers and some other things and trying to say, okay, if Chase Young hits his 90th percentile, meaning he's he's in that. Khalil Mack, Von Miller type of range. If he does that, Akuda really has to pl be pretty much a number one corner to, to match that. But anything below Chase Young hitting that ceiling, Akuda is probably a more valuable player in, in, mo in more of your simulations, so to speak. So there's some nuance to all of this stuff when we're talking coverage versus pass rush and how you get there, you know? So um, we'll talk more about that as we go. So I took Akuda at five. That puts Sam on the board with the chargers at six and this is this feels like a a tough spot in the draft here sam at six it really was i did not like this scenario unfolding for the chargers you know even talking before about there's a possibility with all this talk that the dolphins don't love tua that tua slips all the way to six and the chargers suddenly have a quarterback fall into their laps and you know all of this is framed with the baseline understanding that PFF does not love Justin Herbert as a quarterback, right? So there are, I, I'm sure there are going to be people out there that do and think that Justin Herbert is every bit in the conversation with, you know, Tua at least, and p potentially just behind Joe Burrow. We're not of that opinion, right? We are of the opinion that if you miss out on those two, there is a significant drop to Justin Herbert. So I'm not of the opinion that we reach six, uh, Burrow and 
two are gone. Therefore, the Chargers just take Herbert as the next best quarterback. I think that would be a significant reach given his flaws, even though I think it's a reasonable situation to go to, you know, where you've got Tyrod Taylor as a potential bridge. He doesn't have to start right away. You can bring him along slowly. It still feels very rich to take him at six. Um, and then I don't love the value necessarily at a lot of the other spots that the Chargers could use help in. I love the idea of Akuda falling to them. That didn't happen. I don't, I don't think that Isaiah Simmons has a great fit in that defense because they're so stacked with guys that already do a lot of what he does. He would have to play like a legitimate linebacker role for them. Um, at which point I said, look, screw it. The Chargers always need tackle help, so let's just give them the best tackle on the board, and that's Tristan Wirfs from Iowa. So the, 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 those are the picks that everybody always calls safe. You know, he's going to be a 10-year starter, Sam, 10-year starter. He's safe, and people used to call tackles – they used to call him safe because they couldn't evaluate them. They didn't have PFF to say how good or bad this guy was. So they call it a yeah. safe pick. But in this sense, it really is one of those, okay, it fits a need. We have him as a top 10 projected player. And you probably would want to trade down there potentially if, because of all the things you said. But if you're stuck picking, right. Worfs is a solid option. And that's the thing. We kind of talked about that, right? Is that I think the Chargers would not just answering the phone. I think the Chargers might be dialing up people saying, hey, yeah. do you, you guys interested in this pick? But nobody was because, frankly, it's, it's as uh, ugly a spot for anybody else as it is for the Chargers. So I think they're stuck with six. And I think they just have to bite the bullet and pick the best player at a position they could use. And that's, that's tackle. So my next few picks uh, start to look a lot like my mock draft that I put on pff.com, but uh, I've got mm. the Panthers now at seven. And now that Herbert is, I put Herbert at six. I, I made the move for the chargers. I didn't love it, but I felt like it was a shot that they needed to take. I, there are now other teams. Every time a team comes up, the Panthers, they're not locked into Teddy Bridgewater past a year or two. So they can at least debate quarterback so I debated Justin Herbert for a minute decided no I'm not going to do that with Carolina so I'm going to go Isaiah Simmons there and Luke Keekley retiring already have Shaq Thompson on the field you got a ton of speed at linebacker slash safety with Simmons I like the fact that they brought Trey Boston back to play more of a true free, free safety role so Simmons might be able to play what I like that strong safety slash linebacker position and uh, yeah just speed and playmaking ability for the Panthers, if they can get a corner on the turn, I think that kind of uh, makes this a worthwhile draft for them already. So your role for Simmons is effectively going to be playing the Daniel Sorensen position of yeah. your, your strong safety and base. And then when you, you go, you become a dime linebacker. Yeah. And I don't want to get too caught up in versatility to lose the fact that if you just put Simmons into a simple strong safety role, he's probably really effective from a zone as a zone coverage player who can match up to, against tight ends when he needs to and is going to fly to the football in the run game. Cause that's what that box safety does. He's going to fly and, you know, make those three and four yard stops that you need to make, but you do lose some of the, You don't want to lose the versatility in nickel and dime and let him cover running backs, cover tight ends, blitz, uh, spy the quarterback, whatever it might be. Um, so yeah, I like the idea of kind of two roles, but in different uh, base versus nickel dime packages. Yep. Okay. All right. So that brings up the Arizona Cardinals at number eight. And this is the first pick, I think, that's going to depart significantly from everywhere else. Because, again, I don't, I don't necessarily love this position for the Cardinals, right? We've got some tackles already gone off the board. Um, they're not in the quarterback market, obviously. They're not necessarily in the wide receiver market because they solved that with Hopkins. And they have young guys on the roster that I think they'd like to give the opportunity to step up in year two. So I don't think they'll be the, the one to start the wide receiver rush. They're reasonably set on the, the back end as well. I think their biggest spot is interior D line. Um, I don't love the Brown, the Derek Brown thing, because I think he's going to be that run stuffing specialist. I don't think he's going to bring enough value from a pass rushing standpoint. So I'm going to give the Cardinals what I think is the best pass rushing interior player in this draft um, and that's Javon Kinlaw from South Carolina. Uh, I think Ow. A, he was the best throughout his college career. B, I know it got curtailed because of uh, injury, but he was very briefly dominant at the senior bowl practices as well. I think everything suggests that he will be the most disruptive interior player on passing downs, and that's the thing that's going to make him valuable. Yeah, it, he's got great length, and um, both of those guys remind me of the, the big uh, – stealing Ben Stockwell's here, but the big Jaguars defensive tackles. When I watched Kinlaw, I said Marcus Stroud 
And then Ben <laughs> said John Henderson. So remember the Jags back to back years got first round defensive tackles, Henderson and Stroud. They were six six, six seven, batted a ton of passes. Uh, Henderson was a better player, much better against the run. Stroud was a little bit more athletic, like, but they would just fly up and down the line of scrimmage, making plays despite their size. I mean, that that's what Kinlaw reminded me of from a size standpoint. I think it's interesting here that with Wirfs and Andrew Thomas off the board, I think they're probably the cleanest in pass protection. And for such a pass heavy offense, I think that's why the Cardinals don't necessarily want to go Jed, uh, Jedrick Wills or Makai Becton there. Both of those guys, better run blockers, kind of crush you in the run game, but I think they've both got more pass pro question marks, which is why I think the Cardinals could be in a tough spot depending on where those tackles land. The, I think it's important to give the full quote from Ben, though, because I think it's, it's well put. Derek Brown, I've just looked at the size of him and decided he's John Henderson, so not worth a really high pick. So it's not <laughs> the most in-depth study he's ever done on a player, but I like the comparison regardless. And he's probably not wrong. There's definitely some similar right. similarities there. All right, so the Cardinals with the first curveball, Javon Kinlaw mm -hmm. at number eight. So now I'm at number nine, Jacksonville Jaguars. Uh, again, going with my mock draft. I'm going with Jerry Judy. So it's the first wide receiver off the board. I debated Jerry Judy. I debated C.D. Lamb. I like the far fact that they have uh, D.J. Chark, who emerged on the outside last year. I think they still need a ton of playmakers. I think Minshew, if he's going to be the guy. So regardless, the debate between Judy and C.D. Lamb, I think, is close. And Henry Ruggs is close. It's a stylistic thing. Judy, I think, is going to win from the slot. He's going to get open, whether he's outside or in the slot. But I think Minshew needs a guy that's going to get open in the short areas. He was fantastic throwing the ball down the field. Chark's more of a downfield threat. I like Judy as a short area, short and intermediate weapon. And uh, I think he'll get open. Do Minshew. you really think that the debate between Judy and Lamb and Ruggs is close? I think it is because of the style. Like if, when I describe those guys – I'm chasing a Henry Ruggs because I just I the speed thing is just so attractive right now. I'm I'm all in on the speed thing. And he can run routes and he's just the defenses literally have to account for him. Judy, I think, is going to be more of a slot weapon than the other guys. I have some concerns about his ability to go over the middle, do some of the things that I think C D Lamb does. I think Lamb's probably more complete, more of an outside guy, and I really want to pair them with the right. Uh, with the right quarterback and in the right situation. So I think, I think there's three different style receivers there who are all really talented. I think people are starting to lose their minds when it comes to Henry Ruggs because of the potential of the speed and on all that kind of thing, including like the analytics. I think the analytics are going crazy when it comes to projecting the, yeah. like the quality of what he could be. It's all, you know, the potential of speed plus winning on the outside plus deep average target depth down the field. And all those things sort of projecting, well, if you just increase all the volume of all those things, he's amazing. Like, sure. I just think you see what a Deshaun Jackson or a Tyreek Hill does when they don't even have the ball. It's right. when they on have the, other the ball hand, and when they don't have the ball. On the other hand, I think it is significant that he was at best a third option on his own college team, let alone sure. in the NFL. Um, and then the other question I would have with that is, so I didn't want to be the team that reached for Justin Herbert. Evidently, you didn't either with the Jags. Oh, yeah. How close was that? Yeah, I, I think that's a, a legitimate debate, too. Uh, you know, the Jags. Um, I, so with the Jags, I'm probably closer to let's add to the roster and then maybe 2021 is the time. You know, give, give Minshew one more year, see where he is, and then 2021 might be the, the year that we attack quarterback. But I don't have the second pick for the Jaguars in this. They're, they're at 20. Sure. So I, I don't know how that's going to land. Yeah, you're gonna, it's going to be up to me. You're up at Maybe we'll 10. get him there. Um, number 10, we have the Cleveland Browns. And this has been, you know, one of the most obvious sort of need plus um, value picks in everybody's board. It's been different players all the way along, but the Cleveland Browns are surprising nobody by taking what they believe to be the best tackle on the board. So for us, that's Josh Jones. Um, and I think the important thing is they're going for a left tackle as opposed to a right tackle, because obviously they signed Jack Conklin to a big money deal in free agency. I think Jack Conklin, I wouldn't want to move him to the left side for pretty much anything. So I think they're set on the right side. They get a left tackle to come in and start. And honestly, if they were really smart about it, they would still try and sign a Jason Peters to that one year bridge deal and that bring on Josh Jones slowly. Yeah. And I think the only debate there is not that, 
left tackle is more valuable than right tackle or any of that stuff. It's just like, if I don't have to move a guy, I'd rather not. And the next tackle on the board is Jedrick Wills, who played right tackle at Alabama. I think, I think it's interesting out of all the teams that really need tackles at the top. Uh, they all need right tackles. Some of them need right and left tackles. The Browns are the only team who are like, all right, left tackles the spot. Maybe the Giants, I would say, too. You know, that right tackles really uh, the spot that they're trying to fill. So I think the Browns going with the guy that played left tackles probably just a little bit safer there, uh, which puts the Jets on the clock at 11. And here's, here's where I think the Jets are debating. I see a lot of people – I don't even want to see a lot of people. I'm trying not to pay attention to what people are saying right now. But I've heard people talk about uh, Caleb on chase on here, the edge rusher out of LSU for the jets. I've heard people, I'm, I'm assuming people want to look at corner. I mean, corners, a, ma- a massive need there, but I, I think they still need so much work to build around Sam Darnold. And as much as I would normally say playmakers are what dictate things, I think the jets have to get the offensive line set first before go into the playmaker. So I'm debating C.D. Lamb versus Jedrick Wills, but I'm going Jedrick Wills, the right tackle out of Alabama. For all the investment that the Jets made on the O-line, I still don't know if it's enough. And I think Wills, if he steps in at right tackle, then it becomes a Chuma Adoga versus George Fant's battle at left tackle. Mm. And uh, But at least I feel pretty good about my first round pick. And then we'll take a look at wide receivers maybe on the turn from the Jets. Apparently Joe Douglas has assured Sam Darnold's parents that he will protect him. So that's definitely yeah. where they're going in the draft. Um, it's okay. interesting. The Jets, like, they've, they've gone about this. What is probably in a vacuum the right way of doing it, which is if you basically need to re- like replace all five members of your offensive line, which they did, um, just start throwing darts and throw as many darts as humanly possible, and some of them will come off. The problem right. is that the offensive line is about removing weak links and doing it quickly and getting all five guys to the point where they don't suck as fast as humanly possible, at which point because you have so many to fill, you need to take off some certainties, right? So at some point you should just sign a guy that, you know, fixes a problem regardless of whether you have to overspend to do it, regardless of whether he's like a one year rental in a Jason Peters, you know, he's not a long-term thing, but at least you fix that spot now and then you can concentrate on the other four spots. So I think, it's a weird situation they're in because I think in isolation, it's not the worst way of doing it, but they're in a spot now where if you think Sam Darnold is the future and there's no guarantee that Joe Douglas does think that given that he's, you know, he came in after that draft pick. If you think he is, you need to start fixing some of these spots. You can't just throw darts at everything and hope that you, well, you know, enough of them will work out that will be fine. You actually need to nail some of these picks. Yeah, I, I think it's fascinating seeing Douglas come from Philadelphia, where I always go back to the 2016 season, Sam, where before the season, I think we ranked the Eagles roster like fifth in the NFL with the caveat that they had a rookie quarterback and their biggest weaknesses were wide receiver and corner, right? right. But their O-line was great. Their D-line was great. They had good linebackers. They had good safeties. But corner and receiver were the thing. So 16, they weren't good. But in 17 – Wentz improved the receivers really improved and that was the best year of coverage that they got out of their corners they win the Super Bowl but the entire roster was built in the trenches inside out whatever right and it was it sounded like from what the rumblings were even when Douglas showed up that that's what the way they were going to go and then we see it all the different moves that they made on the offensive line George Fans, Connor McGovern Alex Lewis back Greg uh, Van Roten Josh Andrews all these guys but there's still probably more to do but I think we're going to be sitting here saying, okay, they still have to fix receiver. They still have to fix corner. It might be a two-year process just for that. And by then, Darnold's in year four and five, and, you know, we don't know exactly what we're getting from him. So I, want, the, the Jets are just a, they're just a really interesting case from a team-building standpoint because of, of all the holes that they have to attack. I mean, I honestly think there's a reasonable chance that they are taking the long-term approach with this and saying that if we need to – reset the quarterback position we'll do that like we're not joe douglas is not wedded to sam darnold if he needs to dump that and, and start over i think he'll do it to do it the right way Otherwise, i think he also might be saying look sam i know you hate the youth thing but sam darnold is still fairly young he's the same age as like joe burrow right coming out right um, but the bigger so problem maybe, is at some point you need to reopen his contract if, if that's I, your plan I, I understand i understand it, it, that's a factor as well um the one other thing about all these offensive linemen 
Connor McGovern's coming off a career year. Greg Van Roten's coming off of a career year. Linemen do develop in years three and four. That's kind of like where those guys are in their career. There's a chance that they could get back to average as a group, but banking on like George Fant to all of a sudden develop as your left tackle, it's just risky, right? That's all it is. So I think still going Jedrick Wills makes a lot of sense there. Albeit right. average, average career years. Right. Um, so where are we up to? Number 12 for the Oakland Raiders. This is one of my favorite picks, I think, in the entire draft because they get to sit where they are and snag C.D. Lamb, who I think, honestly, if they had the choice, would be the number one receiver they would take anyway and probably the number one player on their draft board in terms of you know likely picks to fall to them. So for the Raiders to snag C.D. Lamb here, I think that is phenomenal value. Um, Lamb is the one receiver I think in – nah, not the one receiver. The most sure thing of the receivers that I think can do everything in this draft, right? He's great after the catch. He's good in contested situations. He's good in straight line speed. He's good um, running routes, albeit it's, it's slightly – janky style that doesn't necessarily look as slick as some of the other guys but it functions it works so i, I think cd lamb is the the surest thing of any of the receivers did you just describe stevie johnson is he stevie johnson no uh, people have reliably ensured me that stefan diggs is in fact stevie johnson really yeah interesting what i though i can actually see that one in terms of comparisons though i think the difference is Stevie Johnson was all ad lib art artistry when it came to route running, whereas Stefan right. Diggs is like science, it's precision. Like yeah. other than that, I think it's very similar, but very different styles yeah. to do it. It depends on how you look at it. We tend to look at stuff like, did you get open or did you not? And then if you look at it, you know, yes or no. And from that perspective, yeah, they do that. Anyway, I, I love the combination of lamb and car. I, I think, you know, having those two guys paired together. Carr, I think, really needs that guy that he could trust on the outside the same way he did with Amari Cooper early in his career. So as far as fits go, I'm with you. This is one of my favorite ones in the first round, Carr mm -hmm. plus Lamb. Um, so that puts the 49ers on the clock at number 13. And honestly, I think this is one of my favorite fits as well. I'm going Henry Ruggs here to the 49ers. I think his speed in an offense – that has speed all over the place anyway. I think they'll use him well. He's He won't just be a deep threat. I think all that stuff that you saw from Debo Samuel last year on jet sweeps and end of rounds, that was a big part of the 49ers offense. It was not just, hey, we run outside zone, and then we run play action and bootlegs off of that. It was the fact that they had eye candy all over the place, that they had – uh, a Debo Samuel type of skill set and his fierce after the catch running style where they would give him handoffs and uh, running opportunities plus after the catch opportunities. Now you're going to add that speed from rugs. You have speed from Mostert in the backfield. I mean, I just love this as a fit because I think the 49ers will, will get the most out of rugs. And then on top of that, they run a ton of play action and just running them deep on play action is going to open the rest of the field up. So I love it. I, what do you I think? Um, I don't like the Henry Ruggs. I don't like the Henry Ruggs hype, period, right? Henry Ruggs, la or his, for his entire career, had like 200 more yards than Justin Jefferson had last season. Um, I, it okay. Just at some point, this is fool's goal based off the fact that the dude runs a 4-2-7. Like Troy Williamson ran really fast as well and had an equally unspectacular college career in terms of overall production and the idea was, well, he runs really fast. We'll just scale him up into a more NFL offense that feeds him the ball more, and he'll be better. Only he wasn't, right? And the, I, look, I think Henry Ruggs has a huge amount of talent. He's a better route runner than some of these. Than, he's a better route runner than some guys who just run really fast. On the other hand, I think it is fairly significant that multiple receivers were keeping that guy buried down on the depth chart, and he wasn't able to – earn more opportunities for a guy who supposedly can do everything else. So I think his ceiling is probably going to be some kind of specialist deep threat. Now that can still be really valuable. Look at Will Fuller. And I didn't love the Will Fuller pick when that was made. So, you know, if he becomes the Will Fuller of this 49ers offense, it's probably worth a mid first round pick, but that's, that's not that's a significant. If there's a lot of these guys that come out with that kind of skill set that don't become the Will Fuller and just become like almost a gimmick or a guy that people end up dumping in a year or two's time. 
who did you initially use as a com did you use a guy I, I missed what you said that you said if uh did you use a comparison of a guy that they could that they were going to feed the ball in multiple ways that didn't work out or were you just saying that hypothetically i mean i said troy williamson had some troy of the williamson, same okay. traits um ted ginn's the guy that that i'm and I always remember that um, even Ohio State tried to like force feed him the ball, right? And it turned into like he's a ten yards per catch type of guy because he's catching nine hundred bubble screens or whatever. And, and the NFL kind of did something similar. Um, I, I think the scouting community is interesting because they always say, "Here, here are the mistakes I made. Let me uh, let me tell you my mistakes and how I'm going to learn from them." And from people who are you know work with data all the time, that's just like a really small sample approach to doing things like hey i missed on this guy therefore i'm going to alter my process so i don't do that again now i fully admit i'm in that boat right now i'm in that boat of small sample size maybe overcorrecting because i've seen what will fuller's done i've seen what deshaun jackson has done through their career and i i don't mind it's kind of like it's kind of like chasing quarterbacks and the theory that we have on that where you got to take a bunch of shots but when you hit the payout is incredible I think chasing the speed receiver it, with a mid first rounder here might be worth it because if you do hit on that guy that legitimately changes your offense, even if it's not in every single catch, but on a down to down basis, I think the value is just through the roof. I will say so before people lose their minds completely that I compared him to Troy Williamson, like Troy Williamson's biggest problem was the guy couldn't catch a cold and Henry Rogues doesn't have that problem, right? The guy has five drops in his entire college career. So drops won't be the thing that cramps him out of the NFL. But if you just look at the spectrum of what that type of player can become, right? At the very, very, very far end, you've got Randy Moss, right? Stupid speed, straight line, primarily a vertical threat, but he can do other it's, things as well. I guess Moss was different, though. Of course he was different. But like that, I mean, if you took I, away the jumping I look at Deshaun Jackson stuff, as the guy, though. Because maybe, I, but I, if you took... I don't think you, anybody's saying these guys are contested catch guys either. no but even if you took away all of moss's contested catch skills and you just said right you are blazing speed you run past everybody and that's what we use you for like that's that's as good as it gets is randy moss at one end then you've got the deshaun jacksons the ted ginns the will fullers um you know there's a there's a mike very wallace. right mike wallace is another good one but then you start heading towards the end of where it didn't work and you get you know the troy williamson's or the uh, Bethel Johnson's or the there's a whole ton of these like Bernard you know there's a ton of these speed only guys that were never really able to add anything else and at some point teams get bored of that like it's very rare that you get a Ted Ginn who hangs around for like 15 years with the one trick that was never able to be added to no, I understand a couple different ways of looking at it I think the I like the fit for the 49ers. So I'm going with rugs. Went with that in my mock as well. So you're up Tampa Bay bucks at 14. All right. Yeah. My, I mean, my whole point with the rugs thing is that the lack of production there just scares me too much. I'm more scared at the lack of production than I am losing my mind over the potential of four, two, seven, and you know, up, upskilling his workload. You're so a big market would, share guy. I understand. Not even a big one just for when it comes to, I can buy it in certain circumstances, but when a guy is speed and you're trying to tell me that he should be so much more based off everything else he can do, if he wasn't, I'm concerned. Yep. Um, so where am I up? I'm up with 14 bucks. The bucks. Uh, again, we're reaching a spot that I don't love. Um, I'm, again, struggling to find that much value here. You could go wide receiver, give Tom Brady that third guy. I think there's a better chance that they will run with the two wide receivers and try and create some kind of tight end um, heavier system than they had under, you know, Arians doesn't love using the tight ends, but Tom Brady does. So yeah. I suspect given they've got Brady and OJ Howard, they'll try and that'll be the mesh between Brady and Bruce Arians is a, an up an increased usage in tight ends or an increased usage, certainly down the field compared to how Arians was using them. Um, so I don't think they're going to go receiver early. At which point, you know, their biggest area of need is probably the offensive line. And I think their offensive line is okay, but they can definitely use help for Tom Brady. So Joe Haig, I think, is currently slated to start at right tackle, and that's an unideal situation to be in. He's been so, a guard, yeah. Right. So they, they bring – and even though he was what? Uh, Carson Wentz is right tackle in college, right? right? Or left tackle. Yep. Carson Wentz is tackle. Right. Um, so they're going to go with a tackle and bring in the big monster that is Mekhi Becton. 
Yeah, we've talked about Becton quite a bit. I think so from a run game perspective, I think it fits. They run a ton of that duo where you're just, you know, double teaming and destroying people at the point of attack. That They mix it up from a run game perspective. He's probably a good fit there for the Bucks. I think, you know, short yardage, run blocking, he'll, he'll help. There's just questions about him and pass protection. If our friend Duke Manyweather can really get him on track from a pass pro standpoint, though, uh, that's that's a good pick. It's just we're, we're we're not married to the numbers, but the numbers say, hey, there's there are some question marks as far as pass protection goes, especially now if you put him in the buck system with some deeper drops. There is he's he's a he's a projection at this point. That's all. While we're doing this, by the way, there is like a live commentary of Neil's brief attempt to break 2,400 push-ups in 12 hours going on in a in a chat. He what seems to be doing them in. He seems to be doing them in sets of ten, which strikes me as, well, not the ideal way of doing it. But more power to him. Let's see how he goes. Let's ball strategy, Cotton. Let's see how it works out for him. Can you stop being distracted by our uh, workout chat that we have here? I think that's fascinating. He's trying to break twenty four hundred push ups in twelve hours in oh, sets man. of ten. <laughs> that's going to be a cool. lot of work. If this quarantine goes for another couple months, like what's he going to be doing that? All I've heard is he's trying to do a handstand. He's trying to yeah. do 2,400 push-ups. Like his, his short-term goals are always amazing. What are you, uh, what are you doing? I'm spending more time with my kids. Huh. Okay. Who did, which way is the scale going? Oh, you're asking about, oh, I'm doing, oh, I thought you meant workout wise. I, 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 thought you, I thought you meant, I thought you meant just like with my extra time. No, no, I meant workout wise. I'm working out with my wife in the morning. Huh. Okay. Doing a, we're doing a hundred day meltdown. <laughs> so the scale's going down slightly. Really? Though I've been I making a lot of bread, which yes. is offsetting the scale going down. I haven't so. used mine, so I don't know, but my intuition says it's going up. Because you're making a lot of bread too. Yeah, and I'm not doing that, whatever it is you're doing in the morning. Oh, you should join us on the Meltdown. We'll, this is we'll, we'll no in. way that's happening. I'll Zoom you in tomorrow morning. It'll be great. All right, I've got the Broncos up at number 15. I think the Broncos are, again, one of those teams. I think they'd love to have a speed wide receiver. One of those top three guys, they're not there. I think they'd love to have the right tackle fall. They're not there. I think, But I think the Broncos should be in the cornerback market. And I'm going to start – uh, maybe the cornerback run with Christian Fulton here out of LSU. You talk about a guy stylistically who might be able to replace Chris Harris. Um, you know, really good uh, footwork, plays man coverage extremely well. He's been, he was more productive at LSU than Greedy Williams, who we loved as a first-round pick last year. So I, I think the Broncos, the secondary, they traded for A.J. Boye. We talked about this on the pod the other day. Bryce Callahan could play the slot. Fulton comes in as the other outside receiver opposite A.J. Boye. I like this fit quite a bit for the Broncos. Uh, Fulton, our number two corner on our draft board. Would you like to hear a cool statistic for Fulton? Yes. So I wrote an article that should be on pff.com today, basically looking at the draft class of corners and slicing them into all kinds of different ways statistically, right? Whether it's your, some of your um, you know, key performance index, what do you call them? The critical factors. Critical factors, uh, yeah. Critical factors, whether, and those are things like, so the critical factors, Steve, as I'm sure you know, being your thing, are essentially trying to identify the things that are most predictive and most translatable year to year, and therefore the things you should focus on in terms of trying to project players, right? So yep. for cornerbacks, it's things like how do they do when there was no pressure? Um, how do they do when the ball was out you know, before a certain period of time, right? Because at some point, you just – Basically, the longer a cornerback has to cover, the harder it is. And at some point, that becomes a pointless exercise, and you've, it's just a no-win proposition. So it you eliminate all the, how good the quarterback is at right. buying time and all that. Um, so I was slicing them throughout a whole bunch of different ways. But then I started adding a few of my own, right? Because, you know, we got fancy tool here with the database. I was like, yeah, let's see what happens. Not so critical factors, even. Not even slightly critical factors, <laughs> but interesting factors. Yeah. So I was like, okay, what happens if you look at cornerbacks – when you know, we track exact ball location data. So what happens when you look at how they performed when it was a deadly accurate pass, right? So I pulled up all the really high accuracy throws on targets into the corners in this draft class. And not only was Christian Fulton the best grade of the group, he broke up 17% of deadly accurate targets that were thrown into his coverage. That's like twice anybody else. 
wow, I like it. That's good. Right? So, because the, and that would happen if you, you, know, you get it to the receiver's hands and then you play through the hands to break it up or whatever it is. So um, that is great. So that's, 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 that's one way to offset good quarterback play. Right, exactly. A two-year sample size. So if nothing else, what that suggests is that even when the – because, you know, my logic was that, look, the, the perfect pass and the perfect catch beat the perfect coverage every time. On the other hand, the cornerback can affect that, right, by playing through the arms. By He can still make those plays. And, you know, there's a lot of good players on that top ten list. You've got your boy, Amik Robertson from uh, Louisiana Tech. You've got um, Jalen Johnson's up there. You've got a few good players up there. But Christian Fulton's forced incompletion rate on those plays over the last two years is absurd. I like it. Yeah, so way to, way to back up my pick for the Broncos at 15. That puts you up at 16 for the Atlanta Falcons. 16. So I'm going with the cornerback as well. Um, and the one I am going for is Jalen Johnson from Utah. And I got to admit, it's, it's at least partly influenced by that article that I wrote, where, again, you start slicing them in a, 10 different ways. Jalen Johnson was one of those cornerbacks that kept jumping up into that list of corners that has – a really good showing in a lot of different scenarios that I think are either your critical factors or sort of challenging four corners. So obvious passing situations was one where he, where he really jumped up. Um, you know, basically the plays where you know it's a pass. It's all anybody is focusing on now. And more often than not, it's a deep pass because you got to deal with, you know, chasing the sticks to try and keep going. And Jalen Johnson was a guy who jumped up pretty high on that list um, on those plays, and there were a couple of others that I think he was ridiculously high on as well. Um, this one, the, the single coverage thing, that's one of your critical factors. He was one of the better players in as well. So more of a, you know, the eliminate the sort of the help, the, where there's, it's just a product of the zone you're sitting in, all that kind of stuff. When he was actually in single coverage, his grade was really good as well. So I think he's a sneaky, better than you might think corner. Oh, not bad. I like it. So he's, we have him as a first round value, but not that high. So um, that's what happens in the draft, right? Yeah. I'm making I mean, some plays, cool. making some, you know, personal additions or personal adjustments to the board. I like it. So that, so that puts me up on the board for Dallas at 17. And this is a pick that I struggled with quite a bit in my, in my mock because a couple of the corners that I liked were already off the board in my mock. It's tough when you're drafting against yourself, right? And you're making all the yeah. right moves for every team, right? <laughs> it, it, it takes it takes somebody like you to offset things for me. So huh. I really like the fit for C.J. Henderson, the Florida corner, for the Cowboys. So I'm going with C.J. Henderson. Um, I think the Cowboys are an interesting study of what we consider short-term needs versus long-term needs. Because if you look at their depth chart, the cornerbacks of Anthony Brown, Cheetah Bay Awuzie, and Jordan Lewis – look like, okay, we've got three guys. We're rolling three deep at cornerback. But then when you look a little bit further, the fact that the, uh, Cheetah Bay, Wuzier, Jordan Lewis, and then safety Xavier Woods all have their contracts expiring at the end of this year. So um, a year from now, the Cowboys are going to be sitting there with nobody in their secondary. I think the smart teams draft a year out. And whether or not those guys had expiring contracts or not, C.J. Henderson might be an upgrade over at least one of those guys, or maybe all of them. So I like the fit. They need to work from the back to front in Dallas. New system with Mike Nolan over there, kind of an old school 3-4 coach. So I think they'll mix it up between man and zone. I think Henderson can do both, and I really like the fit there, even though he's coming off of a down year at Florida. I like the fit um, because I think he's the most sort of scheme diverse corner on the board at this point. I think you can plug him into pretty much anything. And I don't know what the Cowboys are going to be running at the moment. So if the Cowboys are running what they ran last year, I would make a real argument that Trevon Diggs would be a great fit in that defense. But I don't know if that's true or not. And if they're not, then I think C.J. Henderson is a far more safe bet because he, I think, can, he can work in any system. I think uh, Trevon Diggs is far more scheme-specific in terms of what he will be good at. Yeah, Henderson's really athletic, makes a ton of athletic plays at the catch point, just has some lulls in, co in, in coverage that I think uh, might be able to get tidied up at the next level. So I like Henderson there. So now – uh, you're up on the clock now with what used to be the Dolphins pick, but this is the Redskins now at number 18 after they traded down earlier in our mock draft. Right. The pick that Washington gets for essentially moving down one spot and still getting Chase Young, they are going to add Denzel Mims from Baylor, a legitimate my guy, Steve. You keep saying that everybody's my guy, but this is one that actually is. 
Um, you know, I've done the, the Denzel Mims thing pretty much to death, but good receiver before we got anywhere near the off season, but then has had the most spectacular off season of any receiver, I think available. And that sounds like one of those sort of folly things that you shouldn't like, but you can actually learn things during the course of an off season that you didn't necessarily know beforehand. Right. And Mims, I think is a perfect example of that. The first one being the senior bowl. So I had the highest grade and highest grade per rep of any receiver we've ever seen at the senior bowl. And when we've been grading them, that has identified guys like Terry McLaurin, guys like Michael Gallup. Um, you know, there's a, been a few of these receivers that have shown really well at the senior bowl and translated really quickly. The other thing that's important is that the senior bowl shows them against press coverage reps, which you don't see an awful lot of in college. That's huge. So that's answering a question you didn't necessarily have the answer to from tape, right? How does he do against press coverage? It's also answering the strength of competition question, right? I don't know how many of these guys are actually legitimate quality players. You go to the senior bowl, in theory, everybody there is a college all-star. If he still wrecks the, the place, he's dominating all-star competition. Then he goes to the combine and has a spectacular workout, puts himself in like the 96th percentile in terms of athletes. Now you're talking about a guy who A, was, do was really good, B, dominated in an all-star setting to a degree we haven't seen before, and C, turns out he's a special athlete as well. That, I think, should rightly catapult a guy up a draft board. And to me, so, you know, it's, I think everybody, more or less everybody, you know, Chris Sims, maybe not, more or less everybody has Jerry Judy and CeeDee Lamb as one, two, right? And elevated above everybody else. Then the debate is who's next. And for a lot of people, it's Henry Ruggs. And I think that's getting out of control. Honestly, I think Denzel Mims might be the third best receiver in this group. Wow. You know who I think is the best receiver? Jamar Chase out of yes. LSU. He would yeah. be number one over all of them. But well, he's not he, eligible until He had year. more yardage this season than, than Ruggs did in his career, right? Something Pretty like close, if not. Chase, Chase looked legit. Now, having Mims as your wide receiver three, though, that's a uh, – look, I, I think projecting wide receivers is not – it's not easy. It's not a clean the, – the fact that even Lamb and Judy, for the most part, are, you know, one-two for everybody, it still doesn't lock them <laughs> in as the best. I mean, it really could be anywhere, so – um, I'm okay with you falling in love with Mims. Does this make Washington your your favorite team now with Mims and McLaurin there? No, I mean I really like that. Like they have, therefore, two of my favorite receivers. I mean, at that point, they've pretty much killed the first round, right? They <laughs> they got Chase Young. And, I mean, assuming they were never in the quarterback sweepstakes, which I don't necessarily think they should be, they would get Chase Young and parlay moving down a spot to do that into Denzel Mims that is a freaking steal in my eyes I think that's definitely a win again if yeah even if they didn't have Chase Young if you could walk away with two potential starters but he is Chase Young happens to be one of them so listen to us Washington we'll we'll make you guys good um anyway so you've got uh Mims at 18 to Washington I'm now up with the Raiders at 19 this is another Khalil Mack pick for the Raiders and I'm gonna go LSU safety Grant Delpit who in my mock had, I had him going a little bit higher. He's a guy where he's missed 36 tackles over the last two years. And I know you can't ignore those. I know that they're real, that they happened, but missed tackles are a little bit less stable compared to some other measures. And if you're in the thing that Delpit brings to the table is incredible free safety, split safety type of skills. They run a lot of split safety stuff uh, with the Raiders. They brought Jonathan Aberman last year as the first round strong safety I would rather see more of a coverage first safety. That's what Delpit is. So they could kind of play their roles, strong safety versus free safety. And Delpit can cover tight ends. Great athleticism that shows up on the field. Always seemed like he was making that huge play for LSU on the back end in coverage. So I think it fits a need and it's good value there at 19. All right. Okay. Number 20, we have the second Jacksonville Jaguars pick. Um, you did not want to go the Justin Herbert route at, where were they picking, seven? Uh, nine. No, nine. Um, I think, I, do, I wouldn't have done that either, but I think at 20, it's a far more reasonable proposition. Really? So, yeah, I don't, think, I don't think you can be convinced that Gardner Minshew is the future there. Um, and I think unlike some of these other quarterbacks, you're far less tied into it because the guy was a six-round draft pick and you're paying him peanuts. 
So I think you can legitimately say at this point, all right, Justin Herbert is worth the gamble. We have a similar bridge situation to what we talked about with the Chargers. Instead of Tyra Taylor, it is, it's Gardner Minshew. So you don't have to play him right away. But you can say, all right, look, two guys – that have question marks is better than one guy that has question marks, particularly when the first guy is, is not pricing us out of the second one. So let's, let's take a shot here. What are you, are you worried about Herbert's confidence in that locker room as their second first round pick instead of their first, first round pick? Uh, no, no. Oh. Cause you're, you're a guy that, you know, cares about his quarterback's confidence and which TVs are on in the room and how much money he makes and all that. Right. That's, not so that's much you. which TVs. I think there are situations where that is relevant. I don't know that drafting a guy nine or 20 instead of nine is one of them. Okay. Um, but we didn't discuss the teams that maybe passed up Herbert along the way in this hypothetical mock. So Jets, so Jaguars passed him up and then Browns, probably not. Jets, probably not. Raiders, Niners, Bucks. I wonder if the Bucks would just from a long-term thinking standpoint. I doubt it though. But I'm interested in the Broncos at 15. If Herbert did fall there, I think the, the point of – the reason why I didn't mind the Drew Locke pick last year is because it was just their third pick in the top 40, mm -hmm. right? And they got two other guys, and it's like, all right, let's take a shot on Drew Locke. And just because they went 4-1 and one with Drew Locke doesn't mean, all right, he's the guy. We have to build around him. I'm curious if, you know, a big six foot six guy with a cannon is attractive to John Elway there at 15. Beyond that, Falcons, Cowboys – Redskins, Raiders again, and then the Jags. I, I think if, if you get into the teens, there's not a huge Herbert market there. And then the next team you're looking at is probably the Patriots at 23. If they need to, you know, maybe use some of their draft capital, move up and at least get a quarterback. So if Herbert does fall, it could be, it's either like he goes in the top 10 or he might, maybe doesn't go until 20 as he did in ours. Mm-hmm. Is that fair? Um, and I, th I think it's, I think it is a gamble worth taking for Jacksonville at this point, because I, I would be surprised given what we've seen from Minshew, if he becomes a star quarterback, he might be a serviceable slash marginal starter long-term, but I'd be surprised if he develops into a star. I mean, I'd kind of be surprised if Herbert does as well, but you at least double your chances of that happening. And they are more than, you know, this season away from contending. So let's, let's take another shot at it and see if we strike gold. Yeah, I don't mind that at all. So Particularly, the again, with, with two first-round picks, right? It makes sense right. to, if you've got one spare, essentially. And that's what you've essentially stolen now that you've, you've traded Jalen Ramsey. You've got an extra shot at a quarterback um, now if you're the Jags. All right, now at 21, the Philadelphia Eagles are on the board. I think a lot of people are pointing them in the direction of wide receiver. I think a lot of people are talking linebacker as well for the Eagles. I'm going wide receiver because, yeah, I know they had a great wide receiver core last year. They all got hurt. They're getting older. And my debate here was, do I get another big bodied guy for Carson Wentz? Do I get a T Higgins from Clemson or do I go for the speedster? I'm going for Jalen Rager, more speed, smaller and speedier from TCU, a guy that can play the Deshaun Jackson role when Jackson's gone. Uh, I know Alshon's getting older as well, but they brought in JJ Arcega Whiteside last year. So we'll let Arcega Whiteside be the big guy. Let Jalen Rager be the deep threat for the Eagles wide receiver core. I like Rager a lot. I think he's another um, receiver that has a pretty good argument to be ranked above Ruggs. Um, again, I'm not sure other than the fact that one ran a 4.27 and the other one bulked up and ran slower than everybody thought he would. I'm not sure what separates the two. Um, so the, the thing about Rager running in the 4.4s where his top end speed isn't what Ruggs is, his acceleration is just awesome. I think when you see him getting out of his break and accelerating or just getting on top of the corner, because you know, Sam, you played, right? <laughs> you need to, you, you're trying to stack the cornerback, right? So when yeah. you're trying to stack him and get him essentially on your hip or behind you, acceleration's probably as, it's as important as the long speed, right? Because you're not just running behind somebody. You're trying to like get behind, you're trying to get beside him and then on top of him, right? And that takes that short area burst that I think Rager has in spades. I mean, I also think that, again, I think there's certain players who didn't, whose combine performance was not what the tape shows, right? I think Jerry Judy was one of them. Um, I don't think his, I don't think his playing style slash speed was showed up in his combine numbers. 
And I don't think Rager's did either. I think there's a, you know, he showed up over 200 pounds at the combine. I think there was a very real chance that he tried to add muscle and not slow down. And I don't think it worked. Like his 40 time suffered, his three cone was disastrous. His shuttle was bad. Like I think just across the board, he tried to show that he could carry this weight and still be a crazy athlete. Like people were legitimately talking about him being with rugs in terms of running in the four twos before that happened. Right. So I think he just tried to add the muscle and show that he was still a speedster and wasn't, but you take him from 208 or whatever he weighed in at to 190 again. And suddenly you've got a speedster at which point I, I'm back to, I don't really see what separates him from rugs. I've theorized about that a, a lot through the years, Sam. If you, if you evaluate a guy's speed ahead of time, does that mean that you're right? Like when you said Rager and Ruggs are the same guy speed wise before, but then they weren't at the combine. Was, was your preconceived notion based off a of film study, right? Or does the combine say, actually, Sam, your eyes aren't that good. They've, they fooled you a little bit. They're not right. Mm-hmm. Like I, I always wonder which one you should weigh because I, I love the fact that if you go into the combine with a thought on how fast a guy is, it's a better way that of getting, you know, instead of getting skewed by the combine, at least, you know, either, either backs it up or it doesn't what you, what you thought before. Cause if you use your method, you won't let the combine skew you. And that's when maybe you get the guy, you, you get a steal. Like, Hey, Rager didn't perform as well, but I think I can get as much out of him if your eyes were right in the first place though. I mean, I think the, the answer question. is the answer is to not treat it as a certainty either way, right? To when it happens. So, okay, Rager's a good example. Rager, people said, were gonna be, was going to be rivaling rugs in the four twos in terms of his 40. So, well, a, a, it wasn't just me, right? There was like a, it was a perceived notion that rugs or that Rager was going to run really fast and he didn't. So everybody got it wrong. So, okay, let's say, well, that's, that is an oddity. Now let's go back and watch and see why. So let's go at the very minimum, let's go back and check his tape again and figure out if it was, if you can see evidence that actually that speed is fake, right? That this guy that he ran away from is, is a turkey and he doesn't count, right? So let's dismiss that play or you know what I mean? Like go through it now with a critical eye of saying, all right, we thought he was fast. His tape or his numbers at the combine said he isn't. Let's try and figure out if we can see why that would be. And if you can, at the end of that, I think you have to say, well, okay, I, whatever reason it didn't translate in to the combine. And I think with his case in particular, you can, there's already a reason, right? It's that he bulked up significantly and apparently that didn't have the desired effect. I, I had the same take on Dalvin Cook. I, I watched Dalvin Cook for three years of Florida State break every angle uh, against defenders in the ACC and against good competition, he just outran everybody. And then he ran in the four fours or, or was it almost, was it four five? I mean, it was high four, four fours or whatever it was. Right. Uh, and that felt bad. I'm like, this guy plays like a four, three guy. I don't care what the combine looks like. And I think you still see that at the NFL level. He still has breakaway speed and breaks angles and all that stuff. Right. So um, sometimes your eyes are right ahead of time. Anyway, going with Rager for the Eagles, which brings you back to the table at number 22, for the Minnesota Vikings. So Vikings in a tough spot um, heading into this draft. They've got a couple of first round picks to try and make impact signings, but they basically got no cornerbacks on the roster. Their receiving core is now pretty miserable since they traded away Stefan Diggs to get one of those first round picks. And as you know, our friend on Twitter, Nick Olson said, they might have the worst three tech situation in the NFL. And it doesn't even register as a significant need. Such are the other holes on this roster. So, the good news is there's a bunch of different ways I think the Vikings could go with these picks. The bad news is I don't necessarily love the value for any of them where they currently sit. So I'm coming away with a cornerback with one of my first two first round picks. And the guy I'm snagging is Jeff Gladney from TCU. Um, Again, a guy that I think has a lot of skills that work in multiple different systems and, you know, the Vikings only have the one system, but I think they asked their cornerbacks to do, a lot of different things. So I think Gladney would be a good fit in this defense. I think he's got speed. I think he's got physicality. I think he's a corner that Mike Zimmer could find himself pretty attracted to. There's another one where you, you just kind of have your preferences at corner, Jalen Johnson for the Falcons, Gladney for the Minnesota Vikings. I like it. Add a little, a little flavor to the draft based off maybe what I was expecting where you would go. So uh, Gladney to the Vikings. I'll have the second Vikings pick in a couple 
But right now the Patriots are up at number 23. And I, I have no idea. As usual, nobody has any idea what the Patriots are going to do here. A lot of it depends on how they value the quarterbacks. I'm actually writing up uh, Jordan Love today. He's been a popular guy, I think, at 23 for New England. I'm not ready to do that. I'd rather take him day two, if anything, and just because, yeah, traits-wise, there's some interesting stuff there. But um, I, this is one where I'm going to lean towards, like, where I think the Patriots might go. And I, that now Derek Brown's coming off the board from Auburn. Um, mm. A lot of people are talking to him as a top 10 pick and all that stuff. And the NFL certainly might value him there. If Christian Wilkins can go at 14 or 13 or 14 last year with the Dolphins, um, then I think Derek Brown could go obviously top 10. But in our world, he's dropping. The Patriots get a guy that could play multiple positions on the defensive line. They love that. They love a good, tough run stopper. Um, and he can rush the passer a little bit. He just He's more of a power player. And again, I think New England is a team, when they talk about guys rushing the passer, they prefer a power player rather than a twitchy, explosive player. So I think Brown... Uh, fits what New England likes to do. The other thing I would say about the Jordan Love thing is that I don't think there's any way that they try and essentially um, try and compromise at the quarterback position for one year because this is the year it's happened. Like, I think if they're in a situation where, okay, we're not good right now, but ne that means that we'll be a lot closer to the top of the draft next year where quarterbacks such as Trevor Lawrence reside, they're going to be way closer to doing that than they are. Well, okay, we might be able to snag like a nine-win season out of Jordan Love if we get things break in our direction and he's the only QB available here. I, I cannot see that happening, certainly not in the first round. I, I also don't know if Jordan Love's that much better than Jarrett Stidham. Right. Um, I'm, I'm really back and forth on Jordan Love because I, I know if you just watch a guy's big-time throws like we're able to do, just, hey, here's the 30, here's the 30, whatever. It, it, his really do look as spectacular as anyone else in the class because it does it with touch. He does it with, he does it to all levels of the field. He does it with zip and all that stuff. He does it in the red zone. It's just a matter of his negatives that are, uh, that are more stable and that have been uh, poor over the last couple of years. So um, Jordan Love still probably ends up, I think, going in the first round. Um, so I'm probably. taking Derek Brown at number 23. You're up again with the Saints at 24. The quarterback thing though is intriguing because I would have said the same thing about Drew Locke, and yet teams were willing to let him slip into the second. Um, like it was yeah, interesting I mean, that the sort of two, the two toolsy but iffy quarterbacks were, you know, Drew Locke and then Daniel Jones. And one of them went at six, and the other one was let slip all the way into the second round for Denver to pounce. I would have said that both those guys had a lot of similar traits and issues in terms of if you're, I mean, if you're going to be, this is the thing, it only takes one team, right? That if it you're does. going to, you're going to take a gamble on that. It, they either both go up top or they, or neither of them does. Yeah. Where a guy picks doesn't necessarily say the NFL valued this guy right. the same way. I, I don't know where I don't want to trash Daniel Jones anymore, but they, it really could have been just the giants that valued him as a top 10 pick where everybody else said, sure, I would take him maybe late first right. or in the second where drew lock was right. Or a lot of teams might've really liked drew lock as a late first round pick, but they just didn't have the need or didn't want to do it. And, he falls to the Broncos. It doesn't mean he's a second round player just because I mean, that's where yeah. he landed. The point is that if Daniel Jones somehow wasn't there, the Giants very may well have taken Drew Locke at six as well. They could have, right. to, you know, they would have, they may have been the only team that would have, right. but they may have been the same on both those guys, even if the, the, the overall draft position was dramatically different because they already took one guy. The things so, that would make quarterbacks drop, sorry, in this draft is just the fact that there are already so many starters and a Cam Newton and a Jameis Winston right. sitting out there. So you don't have to force quarterbacks in the first, maybe. Number 24, uh, the New Orleans Saints. Um, not a ton of needs. I think this is a really good roster, and they put themselves in a pretty good position of being able to take you know, the best player available, which is what I think they're going to do. And I think they snag Xavier McKinney from Alabama, who – is basically a poor man's Isaiah Simmons and not even that poor in terms of versatility and being able to do a lot of different things in your secondary or, you know, a poor man's Isaiah Simmons or a, an eventual successor for Malcolm Jenkins, who they just signed. That's the again. comparison I like. Yeah. Right. That's so whatever you want to do, I think this is a perfect situation of you're reaching this point. You don't have a ton of needs and those are the perfect spots to essentially draft for 2021 instead of 2020. He may pick up a few snaps here and there as a rookie, 
but this is a this is a pick for the future, not necessarily a pick for next year. Yeah, he can cover the slot uh, pretty well. I don't think he's as straight line fast as Malcolm Jenkins was earlier in his career, but um, I do love that versatility, safety slash slot. Uh, maybe he be, plays some dime linebacker, does some of that stuff. So I think that would be a good piece for the Saints in their secondary, thinking about what they need to do to to face Tom Brady's Bucks and Matt Ryan's Falcons and the teams that they need to beat along the way. So don't mind that pick at all. So now I'm up with the Vikings, 25. And I, I, wa- I wanted to look at receiver here too, but the, the Vikings have like, what do they have, 14 picks? in this draft they have a ridiculous number of picks they're all like in the sixth round though you don't have to fit you don't have to fill every need in the first round this is one where I kind of leaned a little bit more on what I think they could do and um, not so much the player but the position so I'm looking at you you mentioned the three technique spot I'm looking at Jordan Elliott from Missouri I don't know if he ends up going in the first round I think he's a first round caliber player but I could absolutely see the Vikings going back to the trenches um, after getting a corner uh, Jeff Gladney at 22. So they add Elliott. They already had uh, Michael Pierce added this offseason to play more true nose tackle. So Elliott could be more of your three technique. He's big and long, but he's explosive off the ball. Number one pass rush grade last year among all interior defensive linemen. So I like Jordan Elliott here for the Vikings, even though I did debate all of those wide receivers as well. I wouldn't necessarily go this way, but I think they could go in the trenches if a guy like Elliott was on their board the same where place he is on ours. Yeah, I mean, I think in an ideal scenario, they draft a, t- a receiver and a cornerback with their two first-round picks, and they're good enough players that they're happy with that value. I think both positions, though, are actually a good spot in terms of if you end up in a crappy situation where all the players that you like have gone, value-wise, I think you could go to a different position and be pretty confident in one of those being in a good spot in the second round and beyond. So whether it's wide receiver, whether it's cornerback, I think they could wait to the next round for either one of those positions and address another need if they think there's better value there. Yeah, so the Vikings end up going defense with both of their first-round picks. This is Did they bring in Xavier Rhodes and Sharif Floyd the same draft as well? Yeah, first same first round. Same for, And uh, was that Patterson too? Cordero? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Three of so. them, right? So they're to duplicate the cornerback defensive tackle combo in, yep. in the first round this year. All right, number 26, the Miami Dolphins with what is their second first-round pick because they traded away the second one, the other one, to Washington. Um, They, I think, still desperately need offensive line help. They made the move to go get their quarterback. They drafted Tua, number two. Whether Tua's starting or whether they're bridging with Fitzpatrick, Fitzmagic, you need some better pass protection. They, They made some inroads there in free agency, but this was one of the offensive lines that needed basically a complete overhaul. Um, Last year, they were historically bad in terms of ineptitude. I think they were the lowest pass blocking efficiency of any offensive line, not just last year, but that we've ever seen. They were miserable. So I think this might be a little bit of a reach, but I don't think it's a a bad move. I think they're going to take Jonah Jackson, guard from Ohio State, plug him in. I think you're going to get a technically sound, quality, pass protecting type of guard who can start right away and should dramatically improve one of your five spots along the offensive line. I think the annual tradition, other than say Quentin Nelson, I think the annual tradition is we're going to, from a positional value standpoint, put most of our top guards in like the thirties and forties on our draft board, but some of them are going to go in the first round. So last year, Chris Lindstrom goes in the first round, mid first round to the Atlanta Falcons. And so this, this is very realistic. Jonah Jackson, I think he's in the 30s or 40s on our board right now. We'll see where he ends up landing, but uh, not in the top 32. But yeah, I could absolutely see that fits, uh, you know, fits their toughness and, and needing to build that offensive line for Tua. Mm-hmm. All right, the Seahawks at number 27. This is where I said Seattle's picking here. I gave up my pick what to John Schneider. Do? I gave up my pick to John Schneider and, and Pete Carroll. Listen, Seattle was close last year, all, but all of their running backs were hurt. If they just had a running back, it would have changed everything. Too much pressure on Russell Wilson. They put all that on Russell Wilson's plate. He couldn't even win MVP. Couldn't even do it. So they're going to ease Russell Wilson, ease the burden on Russell Wilson. 
take a little something off his plate. The first running back comes off the board. It's Wisconsin's Jonathan Taylor. He's going to Seattle at 27. I, they, they, they're doing backflips in the war room right now. They can't believe they got the best running back in the draft here at 27 overall. Hmm. Is that where they got Rashad Penny? Was it 27? It was it right. Might be, yeah. So Jonathan Taylor, Thomas. There'd be Jonathan some, Taylor, there'd be uh, some from true symmetry to that as well. Because remember one of the biggest selling points for Rashad Penny was durability before he proceeds to have, right. you know, one of the most injury blighted starts to his NFL career of anybody. Jonathan Taylor obviously has already had like a million carries in Wisconsin's offense in his college career. So very durable running back that they're going to add there. Uh, as much as we trash on running backs and how replaceable they are and all that stuff, it is okay to appreciate the art of a good running back. And Jonathan Taylor has good speed. He's got good quickness. He has good power. I mean, traits wise, I think he's got it all. I think he can catch the ball all right out of the backfield. So um, as far as, as far as running back prospects go, and what they're asked to do. I think he's as well-rounded as anybody in this, in this class. We have him at 75 on our big board. Yeah, I understand. I'm just saying his, his running back skills are quality. What Why is do you hate the Seahawks? I, I just let them pick. I, don't, I let them do that. That was their own huh. selection. All right. So number 28, Baltimore Ravens. Um, I, so I had a really hard time fitting this guy in the first round. And honestly, there are some traits that I don't love and some things that concern me a little bit. But I think ultimately, if a team or a offense, an offense, is going to figure out how to use him, I think the Baltimore Ravens are taking LaVisca Chenault in the first round and figuring out what to do with it later. Um, and honestly, I, I love that fit because of that. I think this is one, A, it's obviously one of the most creative and unique offenses in the NFL. And B, they've already shown they're more than willing to tailor what they do to a guy's skill set. I don't know that Chenault's skill set works in every offense. I think there are teams that are going to need to figure out how to use them. And if that's going to happen, send them to a team that will at least give it their best shot. I, I gave an audible wow just now. I did it the first time when you made this pick. My problem with LaVisca is some of the injury concerns. I still put him in my first round uh, in my mock draft the other day, but I didn't love it. I, I think he's, he's more than a gimmick player in my mind. Um, I, I do think he has good wide receiver skills and contested catch skills and good hands, and he does a lot there, I think. But when you talk about – this feels like the pick if it happens on draft night, the rest of the league is, is giving a collective, oh, no. Like, I can't believe – like, I didn't want to pick him, Right. But I really didn't want the Ravens to yeah. take him. Yeah. Right. And if the Ravens do add him, you know, to your point, oh, let, me just, let me just sum this up. Mike Renner, his comp in the draft guide is Saquon Barkley. <laughs> so, but Chenault has wide receiver skills, but he is that type of player with the ball in his hands. So if you talk about how are you going to scheme up getting the ball in his hands, having Lamar Jackson in the backfield, and having the Baltimore Ravens in the creative offense, man, it does feel like one of those, the whole league saying, uh-oh, how did we let that happen? If he I mean, stays healthy. Honestly, I think that's a great way of describing him is that he's a, he's a player that I think nobody wants to pick, but you don't want anyone else to pick him either, or at least nobody yeah. you're going to have to face. Right. You know, it's like, I don't want to be the one that takes the risk, but equally I don't want to be the one that watches somebody else get the payoff for having taken the risk, particularly a team like Baltimore, who, as I say, is, they're good at doing that kind of thing, tailoring what they do to a guy's skill set. So I think that would be a really awesome pick if it ends up breaking that way. Could be an absolute home run. Good pick by you, Sam, at 28. We've got uh, four more picks to go. So I've got the Tennessee Titans at number 29. And I'm sitting here looking at their depth chart. And Hall of Fame, future Hall of Famer, Corey Davis at wide receiver. Hmm. <sighs> Maybe he needs a change of scenery. But he's heading into year four now, and I, I don't know if he's going to be worth picking up a fifth-year option for the Titans. So if they're looking ahead, I think wide receiver, as much, even though they added A.J. Brown, who looks awesome, wide receiver could be a need on this team. And I think if you're looking – if you're Tennessee, like most of the teams, you're looking at wide receiver or corner because those are the positions. I think if you're going to maximize the Ryan Tannehill contract, it has to be with incredible playmakers around him. So as much as I did love Corey Davis, 
And you might have some value there. Adding T. Higgins here at number 29. Big-bodied Clemson receiver. Incredible catch radius. I mean, just give Ryan Tannehill every opportunity to succeed. And at least for this year, now you've got A.J. Brown, Corey Davis, T. Higgins, and Adam Humphreys. If Corey Davis is let go after this year, you still have Higgins, Brown, and Humphreys. I think that is a team-building win for the Tennessee Titans. You have to give Tannehill those receivers to throw to, the things that he didn't have all the time in Miami when he was just a mid-tier starter. This is true. Um, I think Tennessee could go in a couple of different spots here. I think they could look defense as well, whether it's edge rusher, whether it's even in the secondary. I think there's a lot of different places they could snag. I don't think they would be crazy to go offensive line either. Um, Obviously, they let Jack Conklin walk out the door. They should be okay, at least in year one, with Dennis Kelly there, but that's probably not a long-term plan. Um, so I think there's a, they're in a good spot to be able to sit there and sort of see how the draft unfolds in front of them and just take their, their favorite player uh, at that point. This feels like one of those places where, like, Boise State's Ezra Cleveland goes, who's more of a second-round player for us. You know, but, again, team sports are all over the place. One of those next tier of tackles maybe could go there for Tennessee. But Packers are up now for you at number 30. Yes, Packers are up, so I'm going to halt the fall, halt the slide of A.J. Epinesa from where you, Iowa. Iowa. Um, yep. I, think, I think this makes a lot of sense for them. I think their defense is already pretty loaded, but I, I think they've, you know, they obviously attacked edge rusher in free agency last year, bringing in the uh, Smiths, Preston, and Zedarius. But, and in, inside, they've got Kenny Clark, who's a beast, but I think the guys outside of Kenny Clark have not necessarily – developed into this into what they thought they would be so i think the packers are going to take a guy like epinesa kind of not kick him inside entirely but move him into more of a an interior role and let him take advantage of what he does well instead of plonking him on the edge and wondering why he's not the you know the the pressure monster that he was when being more athletic didn't matter as much yeah, he reminds me of Trey Flowers quite a bit with his power, right. length, idea. His, his hands. You know, Flowers does move up and down the, the defensive line. So that could be a good fit for the Packers. A lot of Packers fans uh, with their annual quest for uh, an athletic linebacker. So they're going to tell you it should have been Patrick Queen or Kenneth Murray. And there's no way that they would pass up either of those linebackers, Sam, hmm. if they were on the board. Just, just be ready. I think they would also be an interesting team in the, the wide receiver market at this point, but I don't love the value given where it is. So I'm going to, we're going to wait until the second or third rounds, you know, the mid rounds for receiver for them. I went with Justin Jefferson from LSU there in my mock. Yeah. Them. And I don't hate um, wide receiver. I just, you know, went in a different direction, Steve. Once again, my theory being, if you have a guy that's really good at getting open the middle, maybe in the middle, maybe that makes Aaron Rodgers throw right. more in the middle. So we'll see. All right, I'm going to wrap it up. My last pick, San Francisco 49ers, their second first-round pick. I gave them Henry Ruggs the first time around. Now I'm going to go with his teammate, Trevon Diggs, cornerback out of Alabama. Diggs is a little bit higher on our board than some of the other corners that went. That, that went. But, again, corners just so dependent on scheme. And I think you had really good reasoning for why you went with Jalen Johnson and why you went with Jeff Gladney for your couple picks. But I think Diggs, to this Niners scheme, with his size and length and you know, you kind of throw him in the mix opposite Richard Sherman. I, I don't – as as good as uh, Emmanuel – as well as Emmanuel Mosley played last year, I don't think you're still going into the season being like, well, he's our guy. Akella Weatherspoon's been all over the place, up and down, burnt toast sometimes. So throw more resources at that cornerback position, digs to the Niners. And so Diggs is one of these guys where everybody, particularly a corner, right? It's, it's all down to what scheme you play and your board is going to look completely different to somebody else's based off the scheme you run in the right scheme. I think Diggs is definitely a first round player in the wrong scheme. I think he's not even close and the 49ers run the right scheme for Diggs. So again, when you pull up some of your critical factors for cornerbacks, Diggs jumps right back to the top of the table in terms of, you know, best grade, best performance in certain situations and they are the situations that you're going to have within that defense. I think, you know, they will maximize what he does well and minimize the stuff that he isn't good at. So I think in a lot of, in a lot of defenses, Diggs is nowhere to be seen on the board, but in the 49ers, I think he's well worth a first round pick. 
I like it. That's why I made the pick. So that's my last one, Sam Niners. And you're going to round it out with uh, Super Bowl champion, Kansas City Chiefs. Kansas City Chiefs adding to the pass rush this time with Curtis Weaver, um, edge rusher from Boise State. So I think this is, look, they, they made the move. They got Frank Clark. He didn't play particularly well last year, though, as people have pointed out, he was battling through various injuries and, you know, changed the culture uh, in uh, quotation marks in addition to actually showing up in the postseason to some degree. So there's probably more to come from Frank, from, Frank, from Frank Clark, but ultimately you still need more edge rushers. You can, you know, you can never have too many of those guys. I think they could go defensive back as well. But again, I, I like that further down the draft. I think the value will be there in the second or third. Um, but I think they can snag a decent quality edge rusher at the top or the, their first round pick, the bottom of the first. I think Weaver's becoming that guy who I know is a solid player. I just don't want to be the guy that takes him. I think that's what <laughs> I've ended up on Weaver. Very productive at Boise State. And, uh, yeah, probably a good fit there in Kansas City. So there it is, man. That's the, the PFF NFL podcast mock draft. We're going to put it on pff.com for next week. We'll write out our thoughts a little bit. Sam, I'm always amazed. You know, they say it's a small world and all that stuff. Nothing makes the world feel bigger than finding someone new – to tell you that your mock was the worst that they've ever seen. Hmm. I mean, how are there so many people in the world that they just go to your mock and say, that's the worst one I've ever seen. There are mocks out every single day, but mine is the worst. I mean, it makes the world feel huge that there's always multiple people who hate your mock more than every other one. And I'm sure we'll find a couple as well. Well, you've also got to ask yourself just how honest they're being when they say that or how many people they've told that to in the last week, you know? I'll take them at their word. Okay. I'm very trustworthy. Remember, if you're, a, uh, if you're a Bears, Steelers, Texans, Rams, or Bills fan, your first-round pick is already on your roster. So congratulations. Let's go through that. Bears, you have Khalil Mack as your second straight year of him being a first-round pick. Uh, Steelers, Minka Fitzpatrick is your first-round pick. Texans, Laramie Tunsil is your first-round pick. This in next year. Okay. Uh, Rams, Jalen Ramsey is your first-round pick. This in next year. Bills, Stephon Diggs is your first-round pick. Stay Which right. one of those are you happy with as your first round pick? <laughs> Honestly, I think Minka is probably the closest because he's on his first contract. And uh-huh. he, was, he was really awesome for them at safety last year. But I, uh, So of all of it, it's like, okay, we got him a year and a half into his rookie contract. The thing I'm not happy about is the Steelers would have been picking at, what, 18? Yeah. And, you know, you think about what the opportunity is there. The one I am most happy with is Diggs. I mean, I think they, if they wanted That's to attack point. number one receiver, they gave up what? Where were they picking? 20 something? 23. 23? Uh, no, sorry. 22? What did I just do? 22. Yeah. It's either 22 or 25. 22, right? So they gave up 22 to get Stefan Diggs, who isn't on his rookie contract, but he's on a really team friendly contract. Um, and you 100% answered that problem. Like, you don't have to worry about will this guy turn into the number one receiver we need him to be? It's like, no, we got one of the best receivers in the NFL and all it cost us was a pick in the twenties in the first round that we were probably going to spend on a wide receiver anyway. So for me, that's a steal. Plus they have a ton of cap room. So it doesn't matter that he's on a, he's on a team friendly deal. And even if they have to extend him to big money, they can eat it. You're right. I agree. The bills actually, that's the one I like the most. The, the tough one is Ramsey and Tunzel and Mac. Well, multiple Being firsts, yeah. Multiple first rounders, right? Because they'll, as as individual players, they'll never, they'll never match up to that. Yeah, right? I mean, it's one thing if you got to say, right, Khalil Mack, Laramie Tunsil, J- or, yeah, Jalen Ramsey, they're your picks this year. Congratulations, you sit out the first round, but you got those guys. It's like, no, that's your pick this year, and that'll be your pick next year as well. That's tougher to to deal with. Yeah, I, I think the thing that's tough for people to wrap their head around, it's like, because I hear a lot of people say, well, you, you, spend, you spend all of your time trying to find a player as good as Khalil Mack, and then you traded him away. But it's like the Raiders, if the Raiders have three mediocre picks, which some of them maybe have already started that way, that at least, like, mediocre is valuable in the NFL. Like, it helps you win games because there's 22 starting spots and probably 30 legitimate spots on your roster that you, that, where guys play. So if you have three of those filled by guys who are average, that might actually bring more value than Khalil Mack. It probably does. And then there's the chance that that average guy becomes really, really good because they're first-round picks. So 
that's why the, the trade down is just another angle, a way of looking at it. All right. All right, man. So that's it. PFF NFL podcast mock draft. Let us know what you guys think. We'll have the full breakdown next week at pff.com. Thanks to everybody for, uh, for tuning in this week. And uh, yeah, we'll be back again on Monday with some more great PFF NFL podcast action. Stay safe. We'll talk to you then. If you're watching on YouTube, let us know what we should have as our backgrounds for, uh, for next time. Take and Change request. it up every week. Yeah. You want to get rid of me and get back to more great PFF YouTube content? All you have to do is push that button right there and subscribe. Thanks for watching.